arts are important everywhere, but especially in Carlisle and South Central PA, we're not always gifted the opportunity of lots of different types of theater. Um, whereas if you'd be in New York City or you'd be out in LA or you'd be in you know Atlanta, it's really important that we provide a space for many different types of theater to speak to many different types of people. The theater was open in 1939. It was the most luxurious movie palace in Carlisle. Originally, it was called the Comerford Theater. Most people don't know that the theater opened for movies rather than live productions. Um, right across the street was the Orpheum Theater. It was also a grand movie palace, but it burnt down the same year. Um, so it really left Carlisle almost devoid of special places to go. People were looking for a bit of an escape. And given the level of luxury inside the theater, it was actually the first building in Carlisle to have air conditioning. Um, those comfy, somewhat reclining padded seats were also an innovation new to Pennsylvania entirely. But in the 30s and the 40s, and even in the 50s, people would lie in the streets waiting to get into the theater. So it was really a special place. Um, unfortunately, as larger movie places came into town with higher technology and whatnot, people kind of flocked to them and away from the theater. So the theater had to close its doors in 86, um, and then it stayed vacant for a long time until they developed a nonprofit and raised money to revive this beautiful old lady. When you're in a historic community and you see something that has been the heart and the epicenter of the community itself have to shutter its doors, it's heartbreaking to a lot of people. So those people who really valued the history in the building did not want to see it just fall to ruin um, because it was. It was the center of downtown. It was the center of the historic district. So it was a lot of those people and their passion and then inciting the passions of the rest of the community, they said, you know what, we cannot let this, we can't let this building fall to the wayside as unfortunately so many historic buildings do. So they said, how, how can we bring it back to life? How can we revive it? And that's when the nonprofit was established and then, you know, making it into a stage um, for live theater as well. Our stage is not big and it has like no backstage to speak of very little backstage but um, it was even smaller when it was just a movie theater so they added on to the front of the stage which then they ended up taking out a couple rows of seats to do that so that we could have a band up there and live theater but live theater is a challenge here for many reasons but one of them is there is no backstage For us, rehearsals usually run four to five days a week, three to five hours at a time. Um, a lot of people here are professionals or um, have professional credits, um, but most people just are doing this at the end of the day. It's something they, they love to do in college, it's something they love to do um, at other local theaters. Um, so they're coming in and giving us their time. Uh, and it is a lot of work for everybody, but it's really, really rewarding. And even in the stressful times, the pushes of, oh my gosh, it's, it's go time, we have to do this. Um, between our incredible technical staff, our crew, our wonderful actors, it comes together and it's beautiful every time. And one thing that we're really working on building is making sure that the right voices are telling those stories and that people are accurately represented on stage. Um, and I think the Carlisle Theater is a, a Players on High is newer. Most of that time has been spent in COVID. Uh, so this is our first full season we're doing and amping up to do some black box stuff. So. I think it's really, really important that we give lots of different avenues in this beautiful historic theater to do lots of important storytelling. It, it starts with um, the, the cast list of who are these people, what is their social status in the play, um, what era are we dealing with, um, and then it's a matter of looking through what we already have, what the theater has in the way of wardrobe, getting people's measurements, mm -hmm. um, and then um, 
Courtney starts sewing. It's huge. It's an enormous amount of work. It doesn't just start a couple weeks before and then you rehearse a little bit and jump in. It takes months and months of production work. Um, production team meetings are huge. You know, working with your stage manager, the person who makes sure all of the things happen, uh, who really manages the production. Uh, they're really kind of the, the spearhead of that. Um, the director has the artistic direction along with um, scenic designers and costume designers and props masters. So to get everybody on the same page, uh, and to make sure that that artistic vision is seen properly or is demonstrated in a way that tells the story accurately. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. The actors, some people just think, oh, it's just learning lines. You're just memorizing things. Well, it's not just that. Like, it's how do you stand? How do you turn? How do you kind of suck the, the audience in and make the story believable? And on the backside, like, behind the scenes, like... There's so many little things that people have to stay on top of. And then if something happens, if a costume rips, if a prop breaks, how does that get fixed? Especially during the run of a show. Like if a show is, is going on, the production's going on and somebody tears their costume, okay, is it a little tear? Can we put a safety pin in it? Does it need to be stitched? Do we have time to stitch it? Can we, like, what, what do we have to do? You get a lot of places that do, you know, a weekend, but sometimes you get two or three week runs, and, uh, and it, can, it can be a lot. It's a constant thing. Um, sometimes legs start to break on pieces of furniture, and you get called at 10 o'clock at night, and you come with <laughs> your drill bag and your screws, and, oh, yeah, no problem, you know? <laughs> I actually proposed that show in, like, 2018 and I was supposed to direct it. And then we had a change of staffing. And then um, some other people came in and they were doing it and then the pandemic shut it down. But you still had RJ and Margie and people who were the original cast. So the challenge is you want to bring them back. You don't want them who have been so attached to it to not re-engage. But then you lost some people. So then you have new people. And they were also welcoming and it was great. It's a show I had done like 25 years ago. I loved it. It's just such a great show. And um, everything kind of, ended up and RJ said this and it was almost better that they had waited because he said he didn't think he would have been able to play it as well if he had done it initially then he had had the time to reflect and learn more about the character so it's funny how that happens it was such a, a, a letdown when it didn't but everybody agreed that boy it was even better they think than if they had certainly this sense of separation from people isolation from people I think is a lot of what Harvey is about uh, Elwood is not best friends with a rabbit because he wants to be best friends with a, an invisible rabbit. He's kind of driven to that because of a sense of loneliness and a need for community. And I think that's something that a lot of people post-pandemic will be able to uh, relate to. I like, I like Tech Week. That's what I liked about being a filmmaker is everything works together and Tech Week is when it all happens together. But Tech Week is for our technicians. It's for our light guys and our sound guys. Um, because the actors, we've had all these time on stage, but they haven't. And so for, for young actors who don't realize it or are new people to the profession, it's not about you being tired because you're standing on stage. You're not doing it for you. You're doing this for your tech team. We're gonna make you look beautiful. So it's, it, it's generosity of spirit is really important in the theater and sometimes you know we forget about that or we don't experience that but it's give and take the whole process and so tech work is it's really harder on the director I mean the stage managers were part-time she's in here 24 7 just about it's really tough for her she's here like uh, you know eight o'clock in the morning to midnight and very rarely eating and the stage manager's job is to make sure that she eats and that she gets rest and that she's hydrated and that she's taking care of herself and we try to unburden her as much as possible so she's allowed to focus but because she wears so many hats as much as you try to unburden her she's still getting inundated with other things you know you think about people who think out of the box 
I feel like a lot of times Ashley steps out of the box, kicks the box down the street, and then makes a new box. And I love that about her because we'll be sitting in, you know, like a production meeting and she says one thing and then I say one thing and we go back and forth and it drives Chris crazy. But eventually, you know, we'll get something that's really kind of new and different and reinventing some older pieces. And it's, it becomes a lot of fun. Ashley's very good at figuring out when the cast is gonna peak, about how much time you actually need. I think that's a really intuitive thing. And I, I always give it too much time, but she's right. You don't wanna peak too soon. You wanna peak as your opening, and then you wanna discover more things. If you cut that off on that first weekend, you don't get to that discovery portion because you basically stop where you're at and try to sustain it. But having the second week, having the second weekend, we got to do um, some interesting things. Uh, uh, you noticed something in your fellow actor that they were just like, oh, did you see what they just did there? That was really funny what they did with, the, with their hands in there. That was really, I never noticed that before. Or, and everyone was like, yeah, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna try that. And it was wonderful because we usually don't get to do that. And, and most houses do have two weekends. So I'm really glad that, that the theater's doing that. We put a lot of things on social media that had rabbits in them because obviously the rabbit is the kingpin in Harvey. And since it was close to Easter and of all these spring holidays, uh, it was easy to do that, find all kinds of things. So we put rabbits out there. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did was make little plastic bags with jelly beans in them. Uh, Harvey is a puka, he's invisible, and uh, so we would make these little plastic bags with jelly beans and a, and a tag on it that says, you've been pukaed, uh, and drop them off at different restaurants and you know, different places around town so that people would pick them up and say, what, you know, what is this? Um, and then it had the website on it. And, you know, we all, we took, we had a lot of photographs taken of us on stage rehearsing and building the sets and, and we posted those just to show people in the community exactly what you ask, and what goes into the making of, and tried to get our own friends interested in coming to see us. get really blue about midway through the last performance of the run uh, and it's like oh this is going to come to an end oh darn I'm not going to get to do this anymore um, and some people say no that's crazy RJ nobody nobody feels like that and some other people say yeah me too so I, I don't know I guess I, I guess that's not uncommon I suppose but uh, for the most part 
if especially if it's if it all comes together and if people are laughing in the spots you you would expect them to laugh uh, or otherwise enjoying the performance whether they're re uh, no matter what their reaction is then that makes it easier to go home or, or go to the bar afterwards and say yeah that was a good job in the next two years what I see is a really large group of volunteers I see those volunteers uh, using our rehearsals as not just time to be in a show, but time to be educated on theater basics. Our teachers, our directors, everybody here wants to share that knowledge. I see it being exponentially more diverse than it is right now, and hopefully being a hub where people feel that they can come and tell their stories, no matter who they are, where they come from, what they do, um, and knowing that that will be respected inside of our walls and told how it should be told according to that person or story. So I see a lot of community, I see a lot of bonding, I see a lot of expertly put together um, shows, and we're of course looking to grow our team um, with directors, um, actors, guest artists, all sorts of things. So I'm hoping other theaters, other people who are interested, or even new people just want to come in and step through the door and, and see what we have to offer.